Hey everyone, Rob here. Thank you for joining me. Um, recently, while I was digging through all my comic boxes that I've accumulated over the many, many years which I've collected, um, I ran into something. It's not that I forgot that I had them, but just because I haven't seen them for so long, um, I kind of forgot they were there until I ran into them. And I was like, oh, holy shit, there those things are. It's not these comics specifically. It's what's holding them and what's in them. Um, I got several here. And you kind of can't tell. We'll show you. But there's several comics in each of these. But what these are, I don't know if it's going to show. It says Comics Defense System Ultra Pro. Back in the day, um, you know, I collected comics not because I was interested in their monetary value at all. Um, I collected them and kept them nice because I liked them and I thought they were really neat. And I wanted to keep them pretty and preserved and just for the long time life of them. So I somewhere picked up these sleeves that these books here are in that are supposed to be better than your average junk comic book sleeve. Like I've got, for example, here's an, an old just regular comic sleeve and you can tell it's an old one. It's been beat up and been holding comics for decades um, with the regular backing board. These things were supposed to be, I don't know, acid free and preserve your books and to their credit, while they're falling apart, like they're they're coming apart at the seams because they're ancient, um, the books inside them still look really good. So I, maybe they worked, maybe they didn't. I don't know. But um, I've got several of these and uh, I pulled them out. I'm like, all oh, right, and let me see what's in them. So we're going to find one book in these to look at, but we're going to pull them out one by one just to see what I've got in there because, again, I've kind of forgotten um, let's dig into this guy first. I'm trying to do it without, because I, I stuffed too many things in here, so they're kind of overstuffed. In this sleeve, <laughs> great. For some reason, I have two copies of Wildcats. I didn't buy two when they came out. I only bought one. I must have got a hold of another copy from somebody else. Um, oh, yeah, they came with cards. I forgot about that. Spartan and Voodoo. What does this one have? Spartan and Voodoo, fantastic. We will absolutely be looking at Wildcats. Um, my copy of X-Men, the special edition. Um, I did a video on X-Men um, number one already with my brother. And this is my actual copy. The one that we looked through was his copy that he brought. So that's kind of interesting. So that's what's in that sleeve. It's on to the next one. Let's see what book we're going to find that we're going to look at today. Man, that Wildcats 2 number cover. I shouldn't overhype it because I want to talk about it when I actually do a video on that. But that is something. Completely forgot about this thing. Shadowhawk. I, th I guess it's the second volume. Gimmick cover. Look how that's cut through. Pretty badass. Wildcats number three. That's interesting. Continuing. What's in this one? Youngblood, oh, you know we're looking at this guy eventually. Spawn number one, my actual first copy that I ever owned of Spawn number one. I mean, again, it's still in pretty damn good condition. A little bending on the corners is unfortunate. Like I said, I did a video on this, but I did a copy that a, a friend of mine gave to me for my birthday a couple years ago. Tribe. There's one thing good I can say about this book, and that cover really makes you notice it. It really makes you look. The contents are so just terrible. It'll probably take me three minutes to review that book. Not very exciting at all. All right. This one. Let's pull out contents in here. All right. I've got... Remove them from their protective sleeves that will save them from damage and destruction over the years. Cyberforce. We will definitely be looking at that at some point. Union. We will definitely be looking at that. We are going to look at Savage Dragon. I don't believe I have uh, covered any Eric Larson books. Um, and it, it was only a matter of time, believe me. Sorry, I'm just repositioning my camera here. <laughs> Savage Dragon. I had read Eric Larson's work. I was reading him on Amazing Spider-Man. If I understand my uh, 
memory and history correctly, he followed uh, McFarlane on Amazing Spider-Man. And it's hard to follow McFarlane on anything at that time. But he did some stories that were really good. I've got some books of his Amazing Spider-Man run that I want to definitely look at. And then he followed McFarlane on the, the, the regular Spider-Man title after McFarlane left to retire temporarily and did his Revenge of the Sinister Six, which was a great book. So I liked Eric Larson. I liked his work. I think that I liked it in a way that subconsciously I didn't even understand. Like, I thought it was just competent. It was fine. He was never my favorite artist. He was never what I thought was the best. I, I was just drawn to the Jim Lee and Mark Silvestri and Rob Liefelds and McFarlane to a, a degree as far as enjoying the art. And Larson, I mean, he does weird kind of funny things with his anatomy, but there was an enjoyment that I got out of it and an appreciation that was really subconscious that I didn't realize until way later in my comic reading life. And it culminated with this. I'm, I can't remember exactly what image books had come out before this. I'm pretty certain that Spawn, um, Youngblood definitely, because Youngblood was the first uh, image comic. So I think Youngblood, Spawn, Wildcats, maybe Cyberforce. But I remember getting this first issue and I was um, out of town visiting um, grandparents. And when I came home, my older brother, for whatever reason, I can't remember the scenario, my older brother who read comics with me and was hard hardcore, 100% into this shit with me, I had read this, he had not, and I handed this book to him and I said, this is the best image comic book ever. This is better than all the rest of them, by far. It is just so good. I was shocked at how good this was. It goes to explain how good Eric Larson is as a cartoonist, an artist, a writer, and a guy who has a solid and complete understanding of the character that he's putting out there. This isn't some bullshit he just kind of come up with, like I'm sure some of the image guys did. And some of them had characters that they grew up with that they made and had on their own for a long time. But Eric has had this guy forever in various iterations. He's shown in interviews. And he knows exactly who and what this character is. And he brought it to life and made the most entertaining, the best image comic that was out. And we're going to look at it. First brutal issue, Savage Dragon. Um, I actually have, and I kind of, I, I've kept it out. And I think I've sat it in a pile, and I, I don't know where it's at, so I don't care. Um, he has collected issues one through three into a collected book and rearranged the pages a little bit to make the story a little bit more clear and um, streamlined. And I think that collected book is the best version of the Savage Dragon miniseries. I don't have it right. Like, I know I've got it behind me on my pile of books that I've dug out to use as content for my channel here. Um, and I thought about having that to show, but we're going to skip that. We'll get into it a little bit later. We'll show the way that he introduced the character, the way that he was when he first put it out. Even though I think the collected book where he rearranges some pages a little bit is actually the better version. But let's look at just how it starts. Now, I am not a Jack Kirby expert by any means, by at all. But I do know that Eric Larson is a huge fan, student, child of the art and style of Jack Kirby and old Marvel comics. And I believe that something that they would do in those old books that Kirby kind of, I think, pioneered is a splash page to start the book. And then the next page is, is a double splash page. So you start with the action there, big action page there. So Eric Larson, creator, writer, artist, inker. He's got his letters, colorists. It's all great. But what a great to jump you into the book. It's just, there's the dragon. He exists. He's in his uniform. And he's diving at an obvious bad guy, right? He's not starting with some multi-tiered pages of explanation or text or some. He's just like, we're into the action. Off we go. Energy, excitement. Let's go. Boom. He decks the shit out of this bad guy. Um, cutthroat, he's called. Well, the bad guy also slices the dragon. Now, you notice, you think that big, muscular, green guy, you might think Hulk, you might think invulnerable. And dragon is extremely tough, don't get me wrong, but he can be bloodied and hurt. And from, you know, right in the opening of the, the series, boom, he's cut open, but he's decking the shit out of cutthroat as this guy here. And Larson does some just amazing, ridiculous characters. He does a single character book, so you might think that that's an easier way to get around doing a team book. Like team books, you have multiple characters and costumes and designs. 
But oh bullshit, he has so many characters, so many villains, so many other guys. He essentially is doing a team book. He just focuses mainly on the dragon. So boom, big punch. Bad guy cut through here, slashes him across the face. Um, I'm trying to remember, a glow bug is this girl's name. Now, Larson, he'll draw the sexy girls, but he doesn't have a style that's like the Jim Lee, Mark Silvestri, Adam Hughes, sexy girl. He's got a unique kind of vibe, but he doesn't shy away from going with the ridiculousness of it. You know, the thong outfit and the little butt shot showing up there. But another thing that Larson does not shy about that's great is the violence. Like, she attacks me. I can't really tell what she's trying to do. It gets a little unclear there. Like, it looks like Cutthroat here is chopping at him. She's just diving on, you know, on him from the back. Punches her in the face. Knocks her to the ground. He gets a boot to the head. Headbutts the guy. Punches him right in the guts. And a super powerful big hit. Now, this is like a very Rob Liefeld energy. Like a punch, a bunch of blast lines, and a bad guy flailing backwards. For all the hype that Liefeld gets for the energy and the excitement that he puts in his, his art, even though as bad as it can be, like really, really bad, the energy that Liefeld will do in his action scenes is undeniable. But Larson has it in equal measure, I think. This is exactly as good or as as good or better than anything Liefeld does in the terms of a big energetic action scene. I think that works perfectly. So the bad guy hits the ground. He's bloody. Dragon's coming up looking intense. The guy could barely get to his feet. The text, like the dialogue boxes are kind of wavy and off to show that he's distorted and beat up and groggy and not feeling great. Dragon's coming up and this bad guy's talking some tough guy shit. Like he's got his ass beat, but he's like, you don't, you, you're, you're, you're a cop. You don't know what you're doing. We're the bad guys. We'll kick your ass. I'm stronger. I'm tougher. Give me one good reason why I should let you take me in. And uh, Larson just punctuated it perfectly with this great, perfect, straight-on shot of intensity. Because I say so. And in silhouette, there's his shadow looming over the bad guy. He's like, oh, good, good enough. Like, he gets it. So he's taking the bad guys out. Everyone's applauding him. So Dragon's a hero. Everyone likes him. He's a cop. He's doing good work. He's, uh, he's popular. And they're like, this is a really interesting transition here to uh, show something like an interesting storytelling element. One of his fellow cops saying, good job, Dragon. Welcome to the force. He says, thanks. The cop says, rough day. And Dragon just says, I've had worse. So we flip over into that. And it just says, before. There he is, lying in a burning field. So it kind of is the, the implication is this is kind of his, where he was found, where he like, I know the story, like I'm trying to verbalize it as if you're reading this for the first time, you know nothing, but you're like, what's this mean? But knowing the story, this is the, how the character was introduced to the world he lives in. He was just found naked in a burning field. There he is. So he you now he's in a hospital bed and he's talking to the cop, uh, his name's Frank, and these two end up becoming friends in the story. And then Larson does some really interesting stuff that I would suggest or, you know, throw out there that he can do that no other image artist could do besides the big action type stuff that he can match Liefeld in. He does quiet, character driven, conversational moments and gets some emotion on these faces. Do you see Jim Lee doing that? Do you see Silvestri or McFarlane can like... Let me try to show an example. Like this cop is asking, hey, you're awake. You're all right. He's like, first off, who are you? And a couple of panels, Dragon's like, I don't know. But the lighting and kind of the expression on his face here and then kind of silent and then just his mouth and then this eye, it portrays kind of a look of surprise and a little bit of shock and a little bit of sadness. Like he doesn't know who he is. Really subtle emotional storytelling. The cop, Frank, he's got his hand behind his neck. He's like, great. Do you know where you came from? And then again, with the, the lighting and the, it's probably lightning because it's raining outside. So a stroke of lighting, you know, intense lighting. Same thing here. Hand over his mouth, just thinking. And then again, look at that expression on his face. He looks sad and confused. There's no Liefeld drawing I've ever seen where a character is sad and confused. It's either flat blank or screamy gritty teeth or screamy angry mouth. Um, and Jim Lee and Sylvester are a little bit better. McFarlane's a little better, but 
Larson's got it. He nails it. He knows how to do it. I think this looks really good. A lot. I remember reading this and like already I'm kind of enamored by the character and his emotions he's going through. He doesn't know who he is and he's kind of sad about it. So they continue to talk. Uh, the cop says, you were found naked in a burning field. Do you know how you got there? Dragon says, no. Do you remember anything about your life prior to waking up here? Dragon says, no. So he's like, we got green skin. Were you born that way? Were you in some kind of accident? What happened to you? Dragon says, I don't know. So the cop isn't getting anywhere. He's kind of frustrated, understandably. He says, who's the president of the United States? And he says, George Bush. And wait, wait, what? Um, so he's kind of shocked. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless me, Father. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So the cop is kind of shocked. He's like, oh, okay, so you know who the president is? Okay, that's a start. So he starts asking him a couple of questions, like who played the characters? Um, when was the last time a baseball team won a series? 1945. So Dragon knows some things. He's like, all right, when's your birthday? I don't know. So Dragon has information, but not personal information. It's a weird dynamic. Um... This is another thing that Eric Larson does unique to him. And I think it's really interesting is he will then go from one scene that we're in, like they do it here. Dragon's found in a burning field, but it doesn't have a text box that says the next day, a hospital, 845 AM, New York City or Chicago or whatever. It's just, he just puts you there. It's like a movie or a TV show. He's like, they don't always have to tell you that you're in a new scene, a new time. You just get it. So he does that where it just, you're just there without a text box to tell you. And he does it here. They're done in this scene and then it cuts to an entirely another scene. We're with the same cop, but now with his wife at home talking about this character or in the background, there's this um, super patriot. He's on the TV there. This is a superhero that's out there. But the cop is telling his wife about who this drag guy is. He doesn't remember any of his friends or he, he doesn't remember any of his family or friends or his personal information, but he can tell you what happened on L.A. Law last week. It's really weird. So they like, they don't know what he is. He's got green skin and a fin. He's strong. It's weird. We don't know what to make of it. They, know, they, they notice on the TV this character here named Super Patriot. They're announcing on the news that he was brutally beat to almost practically to death. Arms and legs crushed, half his face missing. He'll never walk again if, if he even lives. He's a hero in a city that needs heroes. He was brutally murdered. Now, this is another thing that Eric Larson does. He'll put on these bright colored superheroes and big action stuff that looks like traditional, classic, good-natured, easygoing superhero comics. But he will add extremely brutal, violent, realistic consequences which is a great contrast and something you don't really see. He wants to make you look or make you feel like you're reading a book on classic, safe superhero stuff, but he is absolutely going to take the characters to a place that um, you do not expect a book like that to go. So again, back into another scene, Not no text box saying, um, upstairs an hour later, he approaches Dragon. It's just, we're here. So he talks to the dragon and he says, hey, I know you don't know much about your life, but... You're super strong. You're invulnerable. We're being slaughtered by the superhuman villains out there. We need help. You should think about joining the cops, joining the police force. And Dragon's like, look, I'm just one guy. That's a hell of a burden. Like, don't put that on me. I'm still trying to figure out who and what I am. I don't know what to do with myself. I, I can't do that. That's just too much. So Frank is kind of pissed that the Dragon outright refused. He's like, we, we need help. And here's somebody that could help us. He just won't do it. And he's like, I understand it. I got him a job working for my, my cousin, but I just wish he would join up with us. He says, we're running out of manpower, out of morale. We're losing this battle. He doesn't know what to do. So the cops are in a really bad place. There's a bunch of superpowered villains that are just slaughtering them and they need help. And like we said, um, Dragon got a job working for the cop's cousin. There's this warehouse. Dragon's there lifting some heavy shit and some bad guys show up beating him down, you know, trying to rip him off or whatever. Dragon shows up, easily crushes this bad guy's head, crush and slams his face into a wall. This skull ugly guy, skull ugly guy, is that even a phrase? The skull having guy is really ugly, awesome, ridiculous design, jumps at the dragon. Dragon just punches him really easily and bitch slaps him away. Like, I love this simple little panel. 
Power off. Yep, there we go again with that speaker of mine. Anyway, slaps them away. And again, that's another like Liefeld type big image of a guy getting, you know, punched away. And it's a big, you know, panel of him flying back. But Larson can do it just as good. And once again, the bad guy, like we they were doing at the beginning, are like, who the hell are you? You should be working for us. You should be a bad guy. You should be taking anything you want. Why are you working for these cops and humans? Why aren't you just taking what the hell you want? And, he, and Dragon, he's he's a good guy. He's like, I don't want any of that crap. I want one thing. You're butt in jail. So the bad guys are being hauled off by the cops, and they're talking some mad shit to him. Like, you're you're so stupid. You don't know what's coming. You, you kicked open a hornet's nest. You don't know what's going to come for you. <clears throat> um, and the guy that Dragon was working for, he's panicking. He's like, dude, what are you doing? And this guy's pissed off. He's like, I got to get the hell out of here. I spent a lifetime building up my business, and you destroyed it. And now these bad guys are going to come after me because of what you did. Like, you don't understand. You just ruined my life by beating the shit out of these guys. And Dragon's like, look, get a grip on yourself. You'll be okay. I'll protect you. I, I swear it. You know, Dragon's like, I'll take care of you. Just, just calm down, buddy. Um, I'm going to skip by this splash page uh, or this poster insert here because I want to show you a transition from this scene. He's like, I'll protect you. And boom, that warehouse they were in is blown up, vaporized to the ground. Um, those bad guys were not kidding. They were they were going to get him, and they got him. Um, big poster insert. These are always fun. I mean, it's it's not a it's it's an okay. It's a good drawing. It's not anything I was ever interested in taking out of my book and putting up on my wall. Which some books I did. I pulled some stuff out of Spawn and hung on my wall. Um, this is good, but it's not anything I wanted on there. But I thought we'd show that anyway. Big explosion, blowing that up. And, you know, great colors and visual storytelling of like rubble and debris just falling to the ground. And there's Dragon standing. His clothes have obviously been burned off from the explosion, but he can withstand it. It didn't hurt him. He's kind of slowly lumbers out, falls to the ground and just says, damn, you know. Cut to another scene. Again, we don't need text box to tell us that we're in another scene. You just know. This is Mighty Man, another hero in the world, an obvious good guy, like with the hair and the almost Captain Marvel Shazam lightning bolt and the cape. You can tell that's a good guy because he doesn't have a skull face or carrying knives and guns. This is a good guy. This is a Superman type hero. They're saying today Mighty Man battle, his, his battle has ended. Um, they're basically explaining that um, the Mighty Man character, he, you, he, the, uh, not to spoil it, but the powers are something that can be passed down to anybody. It's not that you're, this is just who the guy is and you have powers. He was an entirely different man. They say that his name was Robert Berman and um, he was 67 years old and he he's died. I can't remember. Oh yeah. He was brutal, brutally beaten and stabbed in his home. So, and he wasn't able to transform himself into the world's mightiest man, mighty man. It's kind of a Shazam thing. Um, like we were saying, where he's one guy and then he turns into another guy that is the superhero. Um, but somebody found out who the regular guy was and murdered him. And so Mighty Man is gone. That character, that hero is no longer to be. And so just another with the cop, Frank, just like, shit, we're, we're, this is just the worst. A guy on our side that was very powerful and, and helped us is now gone. He gets a knock at his door. So Frank goes to the door. And it's the dragon. He's like, you know what? The bad guys blew up your cousin's place. He's dead. I'm sorry. That's the bad news. Good news is I'm ready to take you up. And he's like, oh, oh really? And he's like, dragon's like, yeah, I, I need some clothes. Um, I need to go to the police academy. I need to join up. I got to do this. And Frank's like, well, are you, are you sure about this? And dragon says, I've got nothing else to do. Count me in. So he's like, I'm on board. So again, all of this was in the past. Now, for one of the very few times, it's a box to say, now we've jumped into the future. He needs you to know that we're not in the same time frame moving from different scenes. But we've actually jumped into a into the future, back where the book started. So Chicago, now. You've got this girl. Her car is being riddled with bullets. She's getting her ass handed to her. She's diving down. Call for backup. You've got a foot stepping in here. She's like, oh, hi. Care to lend a hand? Here we got the dragon. So you would assume that he's gone to the police academy. He's a cop now. So 
they're kind of pointing out, there's 20 guys in this house. They got hostages. I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, and she's like, well, wait, wait, where are you going? He goes back to this car and gets inside it, gets his guns up. He's like, I'm going in. And then he jumps way up high and then just coming straight down, just hammering through the roof of the house that the, these um, terrorist criminal scum guys are, just hammers right through it, telling him to, you know, hands up, you're under arrest, all these bad guys. Now, they don't look like they're superhuman villains, just criminal scum. So, of course, they're going to, like, kill the son of a bitch. So, Dragon's like, all right. So, he machine guns them to death. Well, I actually... I take that back. He machine guns them, but he doesn't kill them. This is something that comes up that they mentioned that Dragon is an amazingly, flawlessly, perfectly good shot. He's shooting the weapons out of their hands. Like you can see the guns are being hit, but the people are still alive. <clears throat> Dragon takes a bullet to the face, right in the eye, and that pisses him off. So he blows this guy's legs away. So he doesn't kill him, but he's pissed. Uh, you end up with this guy holding a gun to this hot redhead girl's head. He's like, give it up, freak. I'll kill her. Wrong answer. But then you see these sound effects. It's not the buddha 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 sound effect of the machine gun. It's something different. So what's going on? The guy that had the girl, a um, bunch of ninja stars in his arm. And uh, he's hunkered down. The girl runs away. And you got this guy. He's like... Hey, uh, good job, Dragon. You know, nice shooting, Finhead. 23 down and, and wounded, zero dead. So he's he's acknowledging, like, dude, you you, you all those bullets shot, you didn't kill, you didn't kill a person. So that's a that's a very heroic thing to do. Um, so this is Star, is his name. He's a hero out there. You gotta say, I never, ever, ever liked his ridiculous hair. It was a really weird design element that actually becomes a little bit of a story point in future issues. It's kind of interesting. But he's there. He helped out. And Dragon, he doesn't know who this guy is. He's like, hold it right there. And Star's like, hey, look, we're fighting the same battle. We're on the same side. My name's Star. I'm just another concerned citizen doing my part to help out. See you later. And uh, he, Dragon lets him go. So then it's like news, you know, interviewing Dragon. Hey, can we talk to you? I got questions for you. What did you, how was your first day on the job, et cetera, et cetera. And Dragon's saying, I don't want or expect any kind of special treatment. I'm just another cop. The city's been held down. The vermin are trying to take over. I'm here to take it back. And then you got these bad guys watching the TV and they're like, oh, look, they got a hero. Uh, that's funny. And um, so they're all kind of cackling and looking evil. And again, Larson does some of the most ridiculous and awesome character designs. A giant shark dude with weird techno armor. You got this guy. I mean, this is maybe the most ridiculous outfit you've ever seen ever. Ridiculous spiky hair and ball and chain shoulder spikes. This open chest thing and literally a zipper over his nutsack. Why? I mean, so he can go pee? It's just the Eric Larson's got a weird sense of humor and I actually love it. Um... It's so ridiculous. It stands out so prominently why that's there, but it, there it is. And you got this villain in a cape facing away, overlooking the city, kind of Dr. Doom-like, right? I remember reading this and like, oh, a bunch of villains, and there's our generic super bad guy. Man, we've seen a bunch of these. You see him in the Youngbloods and the Wildcats and the Cyber Forces and every other book. Every team book or every image comic book has some major, super awesome, powerful villain that ends up being kind of a neutered pussy. Um, and he will seem this way for the mm, several of the books. But believe me, we're going to get to it. When we get to, um, I think it's issue seven, where Dragon and this guy meet, this guy is anything but a pussy. It was shocking. I don't want to spoil it, but it was really, really interesting. So anyway, that's the end of issue one. Um, Larson goes into a uh, you know big long description of what his history with comics are, the characters that he've had that he's had forever, where the dragon has actually appeared before. He's appeared in a few things in some small publishing places, and he just kind of talks about his history with comics and what image comics means to me, and how the guys brought him in to create a book that he can own and do anything that he wants. And he's excited to, you know, take to do this. This is like the ideal situation for him. He can publish a book of his characters and do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. 
and he reaps all the financial benefit. What more could you want? And the magic moment has come for all of them. And he is the only one that has lived up to the potential of that completely. He is to this day. So this is just for exact context. Let's um, first printing July 1992. Eric Larson is still to this day writing and drawing the Savage Dragon. He's approaching issue 300. He has been doing it the entire time with no interruptions, no stops, no fill-ins. Minus one time where the Image Comics guys switched each other's books, but then he went back and re redid a fill-in issue on that because he didn't want to interrupt his run. So he is still doing it to this day. No one else in the original Image Founding Fathers can say that, with the exception of McFarlane, who's been involved in the publishing of his book. Spawn is still up there going, but he hasn't been writing it and drawing it the entire time at all. Eric Larson is. So credit to the man for doing what he wants to do. Um, another interesting thing. Let's see. Oh, no. Okay, this is just he wants to... A, a classic thing they do in these books is announce the name to... So you're going to have letters pages. Like people would actually write in and they would print your letters to the book and they'd respond to it. Classic stuff. But they need a title for the letters page. So he's asking... Uh, it's a contest. Hey, um, give me an idea for letters page, and if you will make a contest, um, I'm trying to see what he, oh yeah, the winning entry will be awarded signed copies of the entire miniseries plus whatever else I can think of. So you might get some cool prizes. I wonder what that actually was for if you come up with some ideas for the letters page. It's something that a lot of artists would do. So... Wildcats, let's get wild. Wizard number 12, that was a big deal at the time. And then these, I've mentioned this before, these ads for the comics that were coming out. Man, you were always looking at this. You got Brigade, Infinity War. I just kind of finished going over Infinity Gauntlet. They were doing a, the sequel to that, Infinity War. Not a fraction as interesting. That one sucked. The comic Infinity War sucked. The Infinity Gauntlet was brilliant. But... Um, I guess that's supposed to be, that's the cable logo, but it's really cut off. That's really sucks. Just a bunch of comments come out. This is where you look at, you know, what you want to pick up. And then um, just more of the same. So anyway, Savage Dragon number one. Like I said, when I read this, the characterization and the emotional connection to the character through his feeling sad and confused and angry... No other image comic had that at all. Not even close. This was a great book. And like I said, when I, I uh, had read it and then I brought it to my older brother and handed it to him and said, read this. This is the best image comic out of them all. And I still feel that way today. There is no, no single issue of any of the original runs of image comics that were a better overall read as a comic book with art and story than Savage Dragon by Eric Larson. He brought it home. He kn he knows what he's doing. He's the most well-rounded, um, <coughs> excuse me, the most well-rounded creator out of them all. He can write, he can draw, he can do everything. And he knows what a good comic is and he knows the exact kind of comic he's trying to make and pulls it off perfectly. So, Suck it as balls enough, I think. I think I've done enough of that. But uh, we're going to keep looking at more Savage Dragon. Um, great book. Uh, I highly recommend it if you're a fan of uh, classic type comic book stuff, but with a thoroughly modern edge at the time. It's still a great read today. So that's all I've got for today. So thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. This is always very, very fun for me. So thanks for joining me, and we'll see you next time.